And we are live. Hello. Uh, let's see if we have anybody on watching right now. And I don't see anybody in the live chat. Oh, you just got to assume there are thousands of people watching. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So there we go. Anyways, so today in the crypto markets, it looks like uh, Stephen is uh, maybe buried in work right now. But uh, we've got myself, Ryan, and Roger uh, here talking about what is going on in the markets. Oh, and it looks like Mark is on the uh, chat with us watching along. So, uh, oh, hey, Mark. Yeah, hey, Mark. Um, so, yeah, Roger, uh, why don't you start us off with uh, kind of what you've been paying attention to uh, the past week? Oh, sure. Um, so what I've been paying attention to is really some of the changing in market dynamics. And as you know, you know, uh, we started to go into a decline starting on December 16th. Bitcoin pulled back from its high of 20,000 and has been moving down uh, to a low of uh, around uh, 11,000 um, around the 22nd. And then it started to slowly come back, but it was flirting with perhaps going down further. And we were, had a couple of these downward trends that we were stuck in for most of the holiday break. It kind of uh, you know dampened my holiday a little bit. Uh, not too much because I think the pullback was expected, but then, uh, but then, you know, it started coming back as people um, came back from their holiday vacation and started to get back to trading. I think a lot of people were nervous. I think a lot of people were worried about, um, you know, whether or not, you know, Bitcoin was going to keep going down. I think there's always in the back of some people's mind, is Bitcoin a fraud? Is it a bubble? How low will it go? And uh, they just needed the the comfort that it had hit bottom before they were comfortable buying back in. But I think you saw. You know, yesterday, today, um, you know, uh, the trading was pretty solid, and I thought I think we saw some pretty good upside in uh, both Bitcoin and a lot of the altcoins. What did you see? Yeah, definitely. Um, I saw some of the alts take a dip as uh, Bitcoin spiked today. Uh, some of the primary alts, but uh, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the small coins were still holding strong. I saw one kind of sneak up out of the. Uh, Sort of out of the weeds down there. Z Classic, I saw this month, went from uh, $2 on December 12th to trading at over $108 uh, earlier today. So uh, that's a what, 50x return for some traders. That's a pretty good, pretty good day. Uh, pretty yeah. good uh, two weeks. Pretty, pretty wild. Um, so we got to get into this. You know, you know, 50x, you know, where have we ever seen uh, investments go up 50 times uh, from the time that you bought it? Is that is that rational? You know, is this like totally blown out of proportion? Well, you know, uh, it's hard to say. You know, when I see Bitcoin go up, it doesn't feel irrational to me because Bitcoin has a very large global co uh, community. It has years of establishment. Uh, there's lots of money in there. Uh, there's lots of really well uh, informed traders and investors. Um, there's also lots of retail investors there as well, and so there's that market dynamic. When you start looking at some of these other things, you know, 50x return. It's only a 50x return if you bought on the 12th and sold on the 2nd at 9 a.m. So uh, that's not investing. That's trading. Uh, you know, now, Z Classic, does it have long-term value? Sure, maybe. But 99% of the people that bought it, did they buy it in the past two weeks because of the long-term value potential? Or did they buy it because they saw an opportunity for a spike? Who knows? It's really hard to say. Um, I can tell you that on a, uh, what was it, a 100... Oh, 100 and 161 million dollar market cap. It's a drop in the bucket compared to Bitcoin. And if you can, you know, pull 50x on a, you know, a few thousand dollars, then that's a, a great day. Um, I yeah, might put 100 dollars into Z Classic when it comes back down a bit, but I, it's definitely not where I'm putting my savings. Well, then, then you have the reverse psychology, though. A coin that goes up 50x, and if it comes down half price, it's still up 25x. Right. right? And so yeah. is it a bargain at 25x or do you have this fear that it's going to go down to 10x? I, I think, you know, valuation is one of the most fascinating aspects of um, cryptocurrencies. So, uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, the question is, well, is Bitcoin overpriced? Is it underpriced? You know, there are a lot of factors, I think, that go into valuation. I think we're far from really knowing how to value coins. So the next year or two is going to be fascinating for those people who um, are interested in figuring out what the true or fundamental value is. I don't think fundamental, fundamental value is what's coming into play today. And I think there are different mindsets that you have to have when you're approaching cryptocurrencies. You know, there's a pure trader mindset. The pure trader mindset is 
the one that says, well, I really don't care whether these things are going up or down. If I see a good trade, I'm going to buy in and then I'm going to sell at the end of the day or the end of the week or as soon as I see the curve or the pattern change. It's a pure trader mindset. It really doesn't care. You know, the average trader may not care what they're trading as long as they think they know what the trade is going to be. And that's totally different than an investment mindset, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum, right? So if you're, in, if you're investing, you might be investing for the long term. Long term in when it comes to cryptocurrencies, you know, is Bitcoin going to last forever? Well, Bitcoin's probably got one of the best chances, but, you know, even in the stock market, you know, nothing lasts forever, right? IBM wasn't, you know, the top company forever. Apple, you know, is, as long as it yeah. is today, may not be, you know, the top as, company forever. As hard as it is to pivot a company, it's just as difficult, maybe and even more difficult to pivot a cryptocurrency, but it's also not as mortal as a company, right? I mean, cryptocurrency, the software, know. the software is adaptable, right? There's how many forks of Bitcoin now? How many versions of Bitcoin out there now? All still holding value too, amazingly. Well, um, that gets us back to value though. What gives it value? Is it the network effect of the fact people are trading it? Is it the fact that the code like Bitcoin is secure and has been tested and has a large developer community that is supporting it and a large mining community that is supporting it? You know, there are so many different aspects that you know, contribute to what gives it value that, you know, and that it can vary. And so um, I think you have to start by, by looking at different coins have different um, reasons why they have value. Mm -hmm. And the way I sort of see it is that there's, you know, there's going to be sort of this hybrid. So you take the, the trader mindset on the one hand and you take the long term investor mindset on the other. And I think you got something in the middle that right now, this is the early uh, this is the early days of the market. This is the early days of figuring out what this stuff is. People don't really know which of these projects are going to be successful. They don't know which of the coins are going to, you know, be used the most or have the greatest effect. They don't know. The miners can be fickle. They may go for Bitcoin today and they may switch over to Bitcoin Cash tomorrow and then they come back the other way, you know, the following week. So the actual value of the coins may go up and down or may change. I think, you know, you have to sort of have a picture in your head. It, the picture in my head is that there are certain major coins that are likely to last for a long time. A long time to me in this space is five to 10 years, because beyond that, who knows what the, you know, the industry is going to look like or the technology or how it's going to evolve. But if you think what's going to be around for five to 10 years, you know, definitely Bitcoin is going to be around because it's already being used. It's built into all kinds of systems. You know, vendors are using it. You know, there's, there's ATMs for Bitcoin. Uh, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, standards or, or, or uh, you know, systems, you know, both technical and, you know, business systems that are starting to be integrated with Bitcoin. So it doesn't feel like Bitcoin is going to go away overnight. If there's a problem with Bitcoin, they'll fix the code. As you said, it's all software. So, you know, I think there are certain major coins that you know are going to be there. Bitcoin's the one obvious one. Um, beyond that, there's probably a half a dozen that you think are potential contenders, but they haven't been adopted universally by the mar market. You know, certainly Litecoin, um, certainly Ethereum. Um, but you know, you have to imagine within five years they could have competition. You know, is that Bitcoin Cash going to take over the you know the silver place for Litecoin, or is uh, you know Monero or you know uh, IOTA or one of the other platforms going to take over for Ethereum, or is, is Bitcoin going to take over for Ethereum because they may add smart contract capability or token creation capability to Bitcoin. So anything can happen in the marketplace. Yeah, you know, I think so that's... Let me, let, me just yeah, finish, let me just finish the last part. So, you, so the second part is you got these major coins and then you have these altcoins. And, you know, if you can get a 50 to 1, it's great. The altcoins, those the tokens and the, you know, these coins that come out of nowhere and they start with a tenth of a cent or a hundredth of a cent value and then they become tradable at a dollar or two dollars, could, that, that could be a 200x increase. You can make huge money, but it's hard to risk huge money on a total unknown that could be a flash in the pan. It could go up 200 times and then go out of business the next next day. So I think you have to, you know, you have to have a diversified portfolio. And you know, you and I will probably have some interesting conversations around this because you probably do more trading than I do. And I I really am this big advocate that you figure out the best portfolio you can have, and you have has to be diversified so you take advantage of all different parts of the market. Oh, well, and I, so I agree 100. I never tell anybody to trade. Because, like I said, my opinion is that trading, my, my own trading is really uh, stemmed from uh, my own greed, right? And frankly, my trades have ultimately cost me 
uh, opportunity. Um, and so for the most part, uh, I, the majority of my portfolio, I take a, a general trader mentality or an investor mentality of looking for fundamentals, looking for some diversification and hedging, um, and then you know maybe do a little bit of trading uh, with a small portion of it. Um, if I do any macro trades, they're really only among coins that I have a lot of confidence in, like Bitcoin or Litecoin. Um, and Ether, I do a little bit of macro trading with, but I'm really nervous about doing that with Ether. I feel it's too easily uh, manipulated because there's too many uh, corporate interests that have gotten their hands on Ether long before the, the public got their hands on it. What's a macro trade? Is that what some people refer to as a swing trade? Yeah, yeah, maybe a swing trade. Yeah, so like, you know, I'd swing, uh, you know, maybe, what did I do last time? I think I had up to, um, I probably had up to 50% into Litecoin at one point. Um, in uh, about a month ago and uh, and then swung it all back back out um in the course of what a week hey steven nice for, nice to join us hey thanks sorry i'm late yeah no worries i saw your uh, message pop up there hey i just want to address there's a quick question here or a comment here let me get back to it uh mark did say the question is is there really any historical precedent for this kind of phenomenon these coins are a new technology for currency and stores of value uh, and, and gold never seemed to emerge, uh, uh, never, oh, never emerged in five years as a store of value. So I think uh, if I'm reading this correctly, I think the point he's making is that gold hasn't really uh, increased substantially in value over the past five to 10 years uh, after the last recession. And as, um, you know, as a perceived hedge against the you know, fear in the markets, you would think that gold may have. Um, and, and what's happened is, is Bitcoin seems to have emerged as, as a potential um, tool for this. And I think my, my opinion, uh, Mark, to answer that question, is that there isn't really a historical precedent for this kind of phenomenon. Um, the only thing that might be related to it would be if you were to look back at different uh, civilizations over time and look at where uh, money or currency has become controlled or manipulated in some way, and uh, people have decided to turn to barter as a way of avoiding taxation or inquisition on their, their goods or property, hiding goods and property to conduct transactions uh, quietly and privately to avoid taxation or you know, other costs. So I guess that would be my historical precedent that shows the usage of these concepts. Uh, but no, I don't believe there's any historical precedent. Uh, this is the first time we've ever had a globally uh, available decentralized currency that isn't under uh, control of any centralized authority, uh, can't be shut down or taken away, and uh, gives us the opportunity to uh, define our own economic systems. You know, I'm going to take a little bit of the other side of that coin. Sure. So to speak. Um, you know, I think I think I agree with you, Ryan, that, you know, in a sense, this is absolutely new because, you know, we've never seen Bitcoin before. We've never seen cryptocurrencies before. And so it's a, it's an absolutely new phenomenon. And what makes it unique is the fact that it's a combination of really a new financial currency, a new store of value. If you think about gold and silver and a new technology. And I don't we've never had something that was new about all three. And that's what makes it so powerful. It's potential market. Uh, cap and also in terms of the impact that it's having on the world uh, because it combines those three things. But if you look at those three things separately, it also has a lot of similarities to each of those markets. So um, the work that Steve's doing, I'm going to let Steve jump in because I, you know, I think there's a lot of similarity between this innovation curve adoption and a lot of the things that we're seeing in terms of the increase in value can be compared to um, new technologies that are you know, coming on the market. Um, and Steve, that, that's really opening the door for a lot of the research and the work that you're doing. Uh, yeah, so I would, I would argue also that I think depends on what um, dimension of the Bitcoin phenomenon you're talking about. You know, I think we haven't had something that has the characteristics Ryan was pointing out that are unprecedented, right? Obviously, like the, the global nature of it, the peer-to-peer -peer global interaction, the ease of settling things. So, the fact that it's so distributed that nobody can shut it down. But like you're saying, I think, you know, the advent of currency itself is a precedent. Um, the advent of banking is a precedent uh, for this. And the internet, you know, in terms of the 
the communications that's because really you're communicating right now at least as a store of value not as a medium of exchange um, you, you know what the internet is communicating is price which is information in itself it's information about supply and demand right so <clears throat> from a information theory and communications theory it's 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 very precedented and certainly from the growth perspective and the network effect it's precedented there's a lot of uh, people who have published curves um, you know the sigmoidal or s curve um, logistic function and it's it's kind of like population growth in a in an ecosystem where there's some constraint like the amount of land area or the rate at which some food source can grow back and and you have you know this rapid multiplication of a of a, of a population like say rabbits right where they double every year and a half because every mature rabbit can then reproduce um, and then eventually they reach a carrying capacity you know the analog in Bitcoin for maybe the size of the island or the, the amount the, how fast the lettuce can grow right um, is uh, the number of people who ultimately will adopt it and so it levels out and I think the price reflects that right the price reflects the number of people coming in and it does it so accurately because it's a limited resource and what is it 91 or 94 percent of the bitcoins that will ever be minted are already in circulation right um, so we already know the constraint on the system and the only thing that's throttling the price now is the demand against that fixed constraint so and so when right. Roger talks about the modeling I've been doing um, basically I've been trying to fit logistic functions to to the price of the Bitcoin um, phenomenon you know on the, the I've been looking at bottoms, you know, local. Can you show that graph. Minimums. Yeah, I can uh, try to get that up here. So Mark uh, was asking whether, you know, he said, you know, do you expect unprecedented patterns in valuation? And what was really remarkable about the work that you did is that you showed this graph for Bitcoin, and you showed that um, there actually this actually is a pattern. Um, this and it's really cool. You called it the. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny. Uh, it, the, it, the, the double patterns. the double exponential logarithmic S curve. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a double ex exponential uh, logistic function. So, let me uh, try to share my screen here. I'm gonna oh, I'm yeah. gonna adjust the scale of the uh, the chart here to begin with. And but um, I think this is one of the most significant things I've seen because what you did was you you created an analogy directly with the innovation curve. You said, look. The growth of this of Bitcoin is very similar to the kind of pattern you'd see in the adoption of new technologies, whether it's you know when the television cape first came in, or when the internet was started, or you know when um, uh, you know the, the web first came on, um, and you know the fact that this has been done before is also an indication of where it might go. Well, and I also think that's a point that you know the patterns aren't unprecedented, right? You said innovation curve, adoption curves. Um, but we're also, we're not through the adoption curve of cell phones, of internet, and those technologies aren't fully ubiquitous yet either. And I was just reading, I believe it was Goldman Sachs uh, writing about how the world uh, economy is approaching a $100 trillion market cap. And uh, the only time in history that it's seen this kind of uh, consistent growth patterns were prior to other major market collapses. And so this <clears throat> growth pattern that we've got, part of it's supported by technology, right? The, the internet's reaching more people every year still. We haven't finished those growth curves. And so it's really hard to imagine almost where we are in terms of Bitcoin when we're, we're only part way through that adoption curve of, of the internet. And so we've got so much further to go in terms of where Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies can go as, as far as adoption. Um, that it, it, it's well, it's it's kind of hard to imagine. So, uh, so let's take a look at Steve's curve because this is where we're yeah. sort of imagining where we are. In terms yeah, of let me let me adoption. let me get you oriented here. So this is Bitcoin price, and and what the black dots are, these are the local minima on the Poloniex exchange, which isn't exactly to the dollar because it's USDTs, but it's right, where so I had access to precise data. Not, Steve, for the non-scientists, the local minima. That's that's the low point. Yeah, Those so I'm gonna trace. So so say Bitcoin. Well, let me give you another example here. I'll just go over to. Uh, so you're going to you're going to Polynex, and you're saying, okay, let me see where the low points are on the curve. This is the curve that traces the under, you know, the 
the, the drops, if you will, yeah. the lowest point. Yeah, there you go. So okay. on this, I'm picking off points yeah. like here, like here, like here, like here, like here. And I'm trying to fit, I was originally trying to fit just an exponential through them. And so what an exponential looks like is, you know, y, which is our price, right? That's a, the, the dependent variable, equals some function of the indep independent variable, which is date, right? So in this case, it was y equals, you know, some constant, capital A, times some growth factor, B, raised to the power of time, right? And this is one of those exponential curve fits, right? And it doesn't fit so well, right? Because you can see it overestimates the early lows and it underestimates the later lows, which tells me that there's something more curved than even an exponential curve going on here, right? So if we go back to this, this model, right, we see that this, this blue line is, is our exponential curve, and it's doing the same thing. It's underestimating some of the early values. It's overestimating some of the later values. It doesn't have enough curvature to capture what this price signal really is. Now, if I'm going to switch over. These, these other two, um, I'm going to adjust the scale here. So these other two functions are the orange one is a is a double exponential. So this is one where the let me um, see if I can increase the the size of this. It's one where the where the where the exponent is actually also an exponent, right? Yeah. So what you what you found so, was the double exponential fit the Bitcoin minimum, right? Right. So if I zoom on this chart to get yeah. a better view of it, right? I'm just going to look at a, at a certain uh, date period here and, and price right. period. I'm, gonna, but I'm, uh, I'm just going to jump in for people who are looking at this because, you know, what you see, the data so far is at the very bottom of the S-curve. So you see the S-curve gets very steep and then levels off. And that's the technology adoption curve. And so what that's showing is that we're just at the very beginning of what could be the early adoption phase. And we're also showing that it's not unusual as you know, if you think of price as mirroring the adoption rate, it's not unusual to think that the price is going to you know continue to stay on that curve, and it's going to shoot up for the next few weeks, months, as you know people come in, and you know who knows how long it's going to take. There may be you know three to three percent or less of the world's population actually buy our own Bitcoin today, and you know uh, how fast is it, is it going to you know get up there? But the price is going to shoot up just because of the number of people coming in. And this gets to what Brian and I were talking about earlier, which is, you know, that the valuation today is not necessarily based on what the fundamental value of these coins are. As much as you say, oh, well, you know, I don't want to invest, invest in speculation. That's kind of what this market is. People are speculating that this is going to be the next Google, the next Facebook of the blockchain you know, technology, and the prices of all these coins are going up no matter what. If they look good, to, if they To be good clear, story, that's the past year. Right. The people that have been investing yeah. in Bitcoin up until now have not been investing in that basis. But all of the people in the past year and a half to two years that have gotten into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, a large majority of them have gotten in speculatively. But there are many people as they get in that learn that are putting more money in based on principle. And most of the people that were in and especially those who stuck in it through what they call the Bitcoin winter for about three years, um, they're not invested speculatively. They may speculate yeah. that it's going to go to 200,000 or go to a million, but they're invested in a paradigm changing technology and tool to give people back control over, over money around the world. Um, and, and that's something that's really important to understand why I have no fear of Bitcoin crashing. The only fear I have of Bitcoin crashing is a technological failure. Um, and I have very little fear of that because I recognize that it's, in a, it's a constantly evolving piece of software that has lots of people with plenty of capital vested in its functionality to uh, continue working to keep it evolving and growing and improving. Um, so I, I don't really have that same perspective as it being a, a hugely speculative investment. Um, I very early realized that I would prefer to have my paycheck directly deposited into Bitcoin in 2013 and then pay my bills out of it and have Bitcoin left over with whatever's left. 
that was my mentality and philosophy as I learned what Bitcoin was. And I think that anyone who um, gets through the haze of FOMO and, oh, speculation and actually digs into this technology and why it's important and starts to recognize why it's gone from seven cents to twenty thousand dollars. Um, we'll realize that it, it hasn't gone up in value based on speculation, not yeah. one bit. The value has gone up based on true value and true efficacy and utility in the world. Well, it's a true expression yeah, of I adoption. Love, I, I love that. Okay. So yeah. I love that. Let's talk, you said true value, yeah. but I would say it's more a true expression of the demand due to adoption. That's what the value is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and people, you know, people. I, I love it. So ahead, let's Steve. look at these other charts on, and, on my and, and screen show, here. Show the, yeah, show this technology adoption curve because this is, you know, this has not been yeah. done. This is not the first time this has happened. This is a great. So this is some data from Forbes yeah. from a previous, you know, this is back when cell phones were even new because they didn't have complete data on internet adoption, cell phone adoption. And they were prognosticating, you know, these things are going to go the same way as television, radio, VCRs, microwaves. What this is, is it starts off with, you know, very early adopters. These are the people who were like, you know, the, the early miners before ASICs and, and, and GPUs, you know, Satoshi and, and friends. And then you end up with the people in like us now and it starts to rise and climb and then it just shoots up tremendously until it penetrates nearly the whole society. And, and then the, the adoption is near, near 100% of people, you know, except for, you know, really recalcitrant sort of hermits and people who just don't have access to the technology for whatever reason, physical handicap or, or, or um, you know, geographic isolation or whatnot. But you see with TV, microwave, internet, radio, television, all these things have these curves. And the, the stuff that required, that wasn't sort of built on existing infrastructure and required more to be in place, you know, has the slower adoption curves, right? With the slower growth rates, like electricity, telephone, cars. And the stuff that comes along and is really, um, you know, like television, you only had to put up broadcast towers. You didn't have to put up wires all over the country, right? And radio, these things went much faster. And if we look at later curves um, of the internet, for instance, or smartphones, you know, where the infrastructure was already in place and we just added the smarts of the phone on top of it, you get much steeper adoption curves. And that's the way Bitcoin is going because the internet is there, all the underlying technologies exist. And we're just adding another layer on top. Um, but the adoption curve is going the same way. I don't, I don't actually have one I can call up right now. But let me just. Well, but I, I think that's fascinating. But there's something unique that's going on here because what you're showing in that diagram is really the percentage of ownership, which means the number of people who are, you know, adopting the technology. These are the number of users. Here is that we're correlating it to price. So you weren't looking at shares of stock, but we're actually saying because a currency is a technology, and this is the thing that's sort of new, unique, and fascinating. We're saying that the price of the currency is mirroring the, the adoption of the technology. Why? Because they're using the technology to, to you know, trade value. And that's the really incredible thing that we're saying it's not unusual to see this parabolic rise in price because it really reflects the adoption of new technology. And that's why it's important that people who recognize it or who believe in this get in early and we're just at the beginning the very beginning of this adoption phase yeah i'm going to so throw i i just i i think this gives some incredible insight now there's no guarantee you know bitcoin could collapse tomorrow on the, the you know, and we're not financial advisors and you know there's no guarantee it's going to keep going on this curve but if you believe that there is a connection between the adoption of the technology and the value of the currency this this is a really strong evidence to prove it you know, let me just hit this chart for a second. So you'll notice this is a logarithmic scale here, right? At each unit uh, represents, you know, tenfold the next time it goes up. We go from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, right? And when you have an exponential phenomenon, it plots as a straight line on a, on a semi-log scale, right? So this is an exponential curve where price equals, you know, some constant times... The, the exponent's base, E, the natural, the base of natural logs, to some growth rate times time, right? That's, this is what, when we look at the growth curve I charted before, in regular space, right, this is what the blue line looks like when we put it on semi-log space, okay? So clearly it's doing a really bad job of estimating this price history. This price history is exponential 
on a logarithmic plot, which means it's double exponential. If you look at the model up here, we have price equals some constant A times a growth rate B raised to the power of the growth rate B raised to the time that's passed since the inception of the coin, right? And when I put in the actual time of that the first price appeared for Bitcoin um, with the uh, with a, I, I just tweaked to find an A and a B that, that made the fit, right? So, but there's an actual, there's a physical reality to this because the time I put was the time that Bitcoin's been in existence. I didn't just fit some arbitrary time scale. Um, and I was able to match the low points on the Poloniex exchange, you know, very precisely. That orange line is underlying this red line. All right, so that's just a growth line. Now, if we follow this line up, this just keeps going to infinity. And we know that's not real, right? Because it'll exceed the amount of money in the world. It'll exceed the number of people in the world who are demanding this, whatever. So that's where the competing decay function comes in when you start to reach carrying capacity. So what I did was created a logistic function. Logistic functions are normally single exponential. I created one that was a double exponential that goes up and I can put a cap in for how high it will go. And the important thing I want to point out here is I'm not going to have, be able to manipulate the charts in real time, but no matter what I put in for a cap here, if I put in $25,000, $100,000, a million dollars, this part of the curve always looks the same. I mean, it matches very precisely where, where these dots go. And I put in, you know, a starting price of a tenth of a dollar at time zero, which was August 2010, the first time a, a price appeared on an exchange. Um, and what was amazing to me is that with these real physical values in there, representing this, this I was able to match with this double exponential logistic curve exactly what's been going on with the price bottoms. Now, there's market fluctuation about the curve, right? I mean, this price has been bouncing up here. People get a little overexerbent, and but they, when they correct back to the lowest they're willing to pay for a Bitcoin, that's what these black dots are. And... This tells me that, you know, if Bitcoin ultimately goes to $100,000, right, we still have a long way to go. If it ultimately goes to a million dollars, I'll go back to this chart. Um, I can plug in. Uh, I'm going to put this on a... Wait, before, you, before you switch back, yeah. so uh, just, just confirm this. So you're looking at this on a logarithmic scale. That was a logarithmic and, scale, yeah. Right. And so typically when you see like a, a financial, uh, not a stock chart, they often do it on a logarithmic scale, right? Yeah, if there's like compound interest, it works logarithmically, right? You're always increasing. Yeah, and, so, and so they'll show you a straight line. When you see chartists, you know, looking at, uh, you know, a stock, the stock market, it's often on a logarithmic scale, and they'll, you'll see the straight line. And so what's unusual here is that even on a logarithmic chart, um, what's happening with, with Bitcoin and what's happening with this, you know, uh, uh, you know this uh, exponential curve, uh, is, or this S curve is that it's not a straight line that it is parabolic It's going up faster than a straight line even when it's plotted on an logarithmic chart. Yeah, so it's compound exponential or double exponential and by the way um, You know people like Ray Kurzweil who's a, a, a futurist and a and a, and a science uh, Fantasy kind of guy <laughs> um, You know he has he has he has um, confirmed with data that things like Moore's law, where we talk about the doubling of the capacity and the halving of the price of um, semiconductors every 18 months, right, is actually, if you look over the history of humanity in terms of what that means for computational density, right, and you look at past inventions that really were computational in nature, like weaving looms or um, certain types of machines, um, and you plot those, they're actually compound exponential. Technological growth is actually a double exponential phenomenon. It's not as simple as Moore's law. It's more intense than Moore's law. And Bitcoin, nothing shows it better now than this Bitcoin data that I've been playing with. Um, Very cool. Well, I think you're doing groundbreaking research. I think you should write a paper on it and show it to the world because uh, I think you've discovered something that's fascinating. It's in the right. works. You heard it here first. <laughs> let's let's get back so, to some of the uh, some of the other topics. Yeah, we have a uh, we have another we comment to... on here actually. Uh, let me jump back here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Rob jumped in and said um, he he mentioned Ethereum's Casper Alpha announced ahead of schedule the proof of stake protocol 
and uh, asking why haven't Bitcoin devs come up with a feasible scaling solution? So I'm going to first just jump on the answer to that. We don't know because we're not Bitcoin devs, <laughs> but uh, we can speculate a little bit. And um, it's it, it's not a concern to me, uh, just to say that. And um, in terms of what I want to really address here is talking about Metcalf's law as it pertains to Ethereum being the leader in active accounts. Um, I think that's really interesting because there's a lot of Bitcoin accounts that are still um, dormant, but not necessarily lost. Nobody necessarily knows if they're held by somebody or not, right? Because you have the ones that were, were lost. So it's hard to assess that. But what's more more important to me is, is uh, I've been looking at Google Trends. And if you look at you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, start picking out just different, the, the top cryptos, um, Bitcoin's the only one that really has uh, global market penetration in terms of search topics, right? It's what people know about. So when you start looking at um, um, active account holders, uh, not only is that hard to assess to begin with, but you also have to realize that Ethereum has very much been launched by, um, in my opinion, people that it, it, some people that felt they missed the boat on Bitcoin financially and ha have been trying to build something different to sort of do the same thing again. Um, but the the also you have the decade of investment into Bitcoin, not just in people owning Bitcoin, but in uh, the development, the um, development of the community, the development of legislation so that things can open up and start investing in Bitcoin. Um, I question where Ethereum can go as far as value price wise, uh, because as far as I can tell, still they have a lot more in supply than Bitcoin and are still producing um, more Ether every year at an annual inflation rate versus Bitcoin's declining inflation rate. So as far as value as an investment, I still hesitate to um, look at Ether as a good long-term play especially compared to Bitcoin. Was well, that just because you're a Bitcoin snob? You know, Bitcoin is the answer to everything. Not <laughs> really. Nothing... Um, <laughs> decentralized currency is the answer to a lot of things. And uh, why fix what's not broke, right? Like why reinvent the wheel? The only well, reason to reinvent the wheel asking, is to grab Rob's more money. Asking, Rob's asking, you know, so why hasn't Bitcoin solved the scaling solution? Have they? If Bitcoin is the answer to everything. But but again, so so here we are talking about a scaling solution, right? Solving scaling. Um, again, Bitcoin propagates the transaction in ten seconds, right? So what are we scaling exactly? Uh, we talk about statistics, but then we argue about them without actually putting them in context. And and the reality is that if I swipe my credit card, uh, that money doesn't settle for thirty days. Bitcoin might take 10 or 20 or 30 minutes, maybe even an hour. You know, I sent a donation to uh, VPR that probably hasn't confirmed yet. But are they concerned? No, they see a transaction propagated on the network. They sent me an email to say, hey, we got your payment. Uh, it hasn't completed yet, but uh, don't worry, it probably will. And the well, reality so is that that is the exact system we already are in, except that I'm not waiting on a person or a company or an entity to do it. I'm trusting in math to confirm my transaction. And if my Look, if I, 97 if I cent transaction fee isn't enough, I can up it to $1.50 later if I really want if, to. If I buy a cup of coffee, I don't want to wait 15 minutes or two days for the transaction to confirm. And I don't want to spend $45 to, to You don't, that, but you, know, you don't. But you, you swipe a credit card and you don't wait 30 days for it to confirm. You walk out with your coffee because the store knows that you're not going to rob them for a coffee because Visa said, Yep, that's been propagated. That's all you're the waiting for. The benefit of the blockchain is that you don't need a third party in the media. You don't need somebody to tell you that, you know, your credit That's not card true. So that's not true. true. So first of all, the benefit of the blockchain is that you don't need a third party intermediary to know the transaction has occurred, okay? The same as a credit card swipe. That transaction has occurred. Now, are you gonna pay your credit card bill or not? That's a different question, right? When I send a transaction, I can't send that transaction without having the Bitcoin in my wallet. The moment I send that transaction, that is propagated. Does everybody see my screen? Well, so no, we don't see my screen. Hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Hang on. Let's just make sure we're clear. This is a propagated transaction, right? You see the red lettering? That same 
information about that transaction would pop up on the merchant's screen as well. In 10 to 15 seconds, not even, done. Does the merchant need to keep me there for 10 to 15 minutes for a confirmation? No, they do not. They do not require a third party. Now, as to say Bitcoin was invented to eliminate third parties, that doesn't make sense either, right? Because if I die, who's going to access, access my stuff if it's Bitcoin? The only way to create intelligent systems that allow us to uh, pass on assets or protect assets is to involve third parties. We do need trust. We just don't need to trust the system. We need a tool that we can use among people to establish trust and decide how we're going to transact and do business. So Green Address is a perfect example of a company that does that, kind of like Copay, where when you sign a transaction, they have a private key also that you don't have access to that has a time delay, right? So if they go out of business, you still have your funds. But in the meantime, they co-sign your transactions so that a merchant can have extra verification that your money can't be double spent. That is the only right. reason for a confirmation is to avoid double spending. But if you trust the party or if you have a multi-party trust system in place, you do not have any concern for a double spent transaction. Uh, well, I thought the whole whole idea of the you know, cryptocurrency is you don't have to. It's a trustless system. You don't have to trust the other party. But I hear you. Right. You don't. No. 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 But, but you're 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 combining two things there. You said trust system and trust party. Two different things. Exactly. Trusting the party and trusting right. the system are two different things. That's right. And so you know, can you trust the system if the system isn't confirming it? And what you said is, well, if you trust the other party, then it's okay if you don't get confirmation on the transaction. But I look, right because you know I the system is think, going to, because you trust the system to complete the transaction. Yeah, the right. point of all of that all is right, that wait, hang, hang on, hang everything on. has but a trade-off. There are other coins that transact faster with lower fees, and so they I, cause the centralization, well, but they're, they're not decentralized. decentralized. But you know, look, I don't think Bitcoin has to be the one solution to every you know cryptocurrency. You know, it does opportunity. But we that, have to actually talk why, about the pros why. and cons realistically. So, we can't talk so about we, transaction so time we, and make that a point okay, for why we, Bitcoin should work. We, all right. So when we talk about the scaling issue around Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin has its place. It is the most secure. It's got one of the largest development communities. It's got a strong mining community, and it's got it's a great store of value. It may be the digital goal. It may be worth a million dollars a coin, and governments may trade it back and forth because it's easier to do that. So I have this, no problem with I have no problem with Bitcoin. The solutions are there. Goal, but let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. But I think but I think that as far as the scalability, it doesn't have to solve the scalability problem because I think you can have other coins that do, you know, minor or smaller transactions. And that's why I think there's gonna be more than one coin. That's why you and I we talk about Bitcoin there will be dominance. More than one coin. We I never say Bitcoin there's dominance. Be more than it's one like coin. Bitcoin should not be sixty percent of the marketplace. No, but and, that's uh, because the marketplace isn't the Bitcoin marketplace. When you start looking at all those ICOs and all those coins, they don't even matter. You have to compare Bitcoin to the entire global market and then look at that percentage, and that's the one that counts. The market yeah, cap of Bitcoin in the crypto market get, doesn't make sense. This is the conversation I wanted to get into with you yeah. because we were talking about this earlier, right? Hey. So just for anybody who happens to be listening to this, all right, Bitcoin – um, in the beginning of November had 60% dominance. In other words, of the total market cap on coinmarketcap.com, Bitcoin represented 60%. 60% at of, $10 billion. At all of the market value of, and, and so it's, it's it, you know, at that time it was like, what, $150 billion no, 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 no. At that time it was $10 billion. At the beginning of the year, it was 60% no, at $10 year, billion. Dollars. Beginning of November, but but... But, okay. But, well, it was like two hundred thirty. But, but, but so we went from sixty percent at ten billion to thirty-seven percent at what? What are we at now? Two hundred and eighty right. billion. Yeah. No. Now, now we're about six hundred and forty billion. So no, no, no. For billion. for just Bitcoin, just the Bitcoin market yeah, cap know. at the beginning of the year was ten billion, at sixty okay. percent penetration, and then now yeah. it's at thirty-seven percent penetration, but it's two hundred and eighty billion dollars. Okay, but let's but let's bring up the chart on uh, coinmarketcap.com because if we uh, uh, if we click on that and maybe I can bring it up. I'm not so good at uh, all this. Two hundred fifty-three billion. Sorry, it was two eighty earlier. Yeah. Okay. So so what's interesting is if you click on the uh, it has the dominance uh, link. 
Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, plug you or here. Let's do this, and I will share. I can, well, I'm sharing. So okay, let me, got let me it. try it. And there you go. Despite my uh, slowness here. Um, so, You're on. All right. So we're bringing up the, the total market cap. All right. And so if we look back, uh, if we look back, and that's a really interesting chart. So if we look back uh, at uh, January this year, which what you were talking about, right? Yep. Um, so Bitcoin actually represented 91% back in, oh, that's 16, sorry. Um, so back in January of 17, it represented, looks like 85, 87%, right, of the market cap. Mm -hmm. And uh, does it give us the number of the total market cap? Uh, that's the percentage dominance. But anyway, yeah, at, at the time, we, we can look at the, what the market cap was, but um, right. I, uh, it might be, you said it was 10 billion. That might be right. And yeah, I, I think it was around 10. Okay. So if we look at it in June of, of uh, or what is this, June 20th, it had dropped to about where it is now, 38.93%. Now that's a huge drop. And you could have easily said, right? And your, your argument on this, and I don't want to speak for you, but you'll tell me if I'm right or wrong. But you, sure. you, what you were saying earlier is that, oh, you've got all these tokens coming in and they're just diluting the value and you really can't consider all these different coins there um, because they're, you know, just anybody can create a token and, then, you know, it's not really comparing apples to apples. You should just compare the major coins. But here's the well, thing. Well, if you're looking at market cap, yes, because any added coin is no different than a new IPO stock launched or any other asset. I just carved little figurines and started selling them. Those are now assets on yeah. a market. So yeah. if you're going to look at market penetration of Bitcoin in that way, then we need to look at the market penetration of Bitcoin to the entire world, not the cryptocurrency world, because well, we're creating that, that, would be interesting the, that too. world is creating cryptocurrencies that are actually they're they don't have to be cryptocurrencies right there's nothing that significantly yeah, yeah, yeah. makes we're them not, we're not looking at the entire world we're just looking at cryptocurrency when somebody goes on a coinbase they're not buying every asset in the world they're buying you know bitcoin litecoin ethereum and then once they get that they're going to you know transfer it to another exchange where they buy you know uh, neo or you know monero or whatever else it is right right well so that's the money that's, the money that's coming into this talent. new technology you know it, it makes sense to talk about the total market cap the best number we have is this you know coinmarketcap.com and so mm -hmm. one of the things that's going on here is you know it, is it's not just all these coins are diluting it because if you look down to 38 percent and then what happened bitcoin started becoming dominant again it was all people were buying and it went right back up to 60 percent 62 percent on december 10th yeah right? because when bitcoin starts to go up people that have invested in things that they have no clue about see they start going down or they see that they're missing out on the action in bitcoin and they jump out of whatever they're in back into bitcoin so but what i contend is this is you know this is a natural thing that you know look, yeah. it does not make sense for one coin to represent 60%. So it's like, okay, there are 1,300 coins out there. One coin, Bitcoin, represents 60% of the market share. And the market share in December was, let's say it was 400 billion. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, so one coin represents more than 200 billion and the other 1,300 that might be tradable or trading, they represent the other 190, you know, billion dollars. So it, you have one coin representing more than half of it and the other, 1300 representing less than half it. That yeah, because most of them are scams. It makes total sense because exactly. most of them are scams. Right, so let's get to this. Let's <laughs> get to this. So that's what I think this curve is showing is that, you know, is, is inevitably, first of all, I, don't, I think there's going to be more than one coin. Because if you, if you believe that the Bitcoin's dominance is true, then you're saying, look, they're all scams. The only one that's really going to have value is Bitcoin because that's the one with the developer community. That's the one with all the miners. That's the one, that's the one people are going to invest in long term. That's the store of value. The rest of them are eventually going to go to bust. I don't know if it's... You know, I don't, think, that, I don't think the rest of them are going to go to bust. My point is that what has a tr true store value is a unit of account that a significant community has agreed to support, develop, and transact in. And that exists in Ethereum, though I don't like Ether, I admit, it will likely be a long-term contender because it has that. Dash has that. Litecoin has that. Most of these projects out there, A, don't need to be on a blockchain, B, don't have any fundamentals to back them up and are literally scamming people. They're just copy-paste, creating a new version of something, claiming that it's better because people think, 
oh, I've won in Bitcoin, so it can't go any higher. I'm going to jump out. Or people getting in go, oh, it's gone too far. I can't get any further, so I'm going to buy something else. And unfortunately, or people saying, I better diversify. Let's invest in some of these other things. Exactly. So diversification is one thing, and looking at things that are worth your, your money is certainly worthwhile. But the majority of the altcoins that you see skyrocketing um, are not worth what, what they're being valued at. Um, and what's happening is that's creating a huge buy opportunity in Bitcoin. Because every time Bitcoin slows down, and it's happened the past three sessions since the ICO started to really happen, uh, the altcoins surge. And because people go, oh, I better diversify. Maybe I'm missing out on some new technology. Maybe this technology might break. Um, but the reality is the majority of those things that people are investing in are not going to gain the money, right? They're not really going to succeed because they haven't done anything substantially different than Bitcoin. And they don't have enough of a community to support them. So at the end of the day, when people realize that they're losing their opportunity because Bitcoin continues to go up because trillions of dollars are rolling in, most people are going to pull out of those investments unless they're major capital investors. They're going to hold fast to a particular mission and drive it forward. But most of those people and, who and threw their $100 or $200 or whatever it might be. So <laughs> this is a, this it's not Bitcoin about Bitcoin. Time, I own other things too, and I'm 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 ready at the drop of a dime to switch. So, guys, can I offer a third perspective? Yeah, please. <laughs> I think first of all, um, I don't think everything's a scam with the altcoins, but utility is the key. And I think a lot of people offering the altcoins are are have identified a problem in society. They've made claims about how they're going to solve that problem with a blockchain solution tied to their coin. And many of them have nothing more than a claim. All right. So that's part of the problem. Now, some of them have a lot more than a claim. They have actually a valid business model, a good plan. And I think these are like the quality coins that Roger is saying are going to be around and are going to appreciate in value because they have, they're going to have utility in a future business model. All right. So I just want to make that point. Second of all, um, I have some data to share. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Um, Just to be clear, I keep saying 95%. That still leaves hundreds of coins that are not scams. So right? I think you're but both think right. That's, <laughs> I think that's the point. And that's where we yes. got to go because initially, people are not going to be able to tell which of the scams or, and they may not be scams. They just may be projects that are not as successful. They may just not pan out. And, but we're not going to know that. In we're not going to know that for maybe, you know, six months or six years for some of them because you know the technology so, or the concepts may take a while to prove out so on the right. notion of utility the other thing to consider is use case right and so this is where you hear people like Roger Ver saying you know the use case for for Bitcoin doesn't exist because it's not a medium of exchange well no it's not and it's probably not going to be because of the transaction fees and the settling times I gotta address oh, that remind me to well you just you just addressed it for about 10 minutes so <laughs> well um, and I'll say part of it. I'll say why because there's other competitors right that may be able to do this better um, but uh, as a store of value it's unrivaled right and because it's the first and because it's rock solid and because the the proof of work and the level of redundancy in the distributed ledger, is so much greater. It's at maximum, right? It's more than any altcoin that's doing proof of um, stake or, um, or you know, partially. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, not t fully redundant ledgers, right? Or sidechain stuff. Because it has those attributes, it is the the gold standard for permanently indelible, immalleable recording of transactions, right? So when you go to get your gold bullion out, you know your gold bullion is going to be there, and everybody's going to agree on it. However, I don't need that to buy my laundry detergent or a cup of coffee. And that's where the use case makes room for some altcoins or other solutions like the Lightning Network or sidechains or things like that. Or payment processing where we do trust a third party. And like you were saying, Ryan, you see that the payment's been transmitted just because it hasn't been verified doesn't mean that we can't put trust in it enough to take your two dollars and give you your cup of coffee because that's how many times of out of a hundred is that am I going to get burned right but that's only half of it right yeah. because mining is done for profit right now which is the only reason the mining fees are so high because you have a bunch of large mining firms that are mining for profit and people investing in mining for profit at a certain point though when 
enough people have significant capital in Bitcoin, like uh, yourself, you've started running a Bitcoin node. Let me ask you, why do you run a Bitcoin node? Oh, I just do it to, to, to maintain the sort of the technical level of... Okay. You know, well, and, no, no, and, there's, and, there's to participate in the community. Exactly. And so my point to that, that there are, you know, all the miners have all these nodes and that the, the, the regular, um, you know, democratic right. base of users aren't running their own nodes. I want to, I want to make sure that that 10,000 people out there who are running nodes continue to grow and include these single nodes, even though I'll never make a, a single nickel off of mining. Right. Yeah. So what happens though is technology evolves, right, in leaps and bounds in terms of, of, of the hardware capabilities. And so all of these millions and millions of dollars that are invested in mining facilities right now, all of that same hardware is gonna be obsolete, right? And so everybody's gotta keep upgrading. And at a certain point, they have to decide, is it worth it to keep upgrading? And when they decide that it doesn't make sense because it's not profitable enough to keep investing in more mining hardware, then who's going to mine the coin? Well, I'll tell you who's gonna mine the coin, me, right? People who have the currency will mine the coin and yeah, they'll spend a little bit on hardware and they'll get rewarded in transaction fees to offset that cost, but the investment will be an investment in protecting their asset. And they will happily take low transaction fees to book transactions into the blockchain because it maintains and protects the value of the assets they hold. So then I go back to, again, we're currently at a $250 billion market cap, soon to be a trillion dollar market cap. And ultimately we're still talking about scaling and fees. And I believe that there's room to improve the technology, but the reality is that we keep throwing up reasons for failure that don't exist or reasons to look elsewhere that aren't really a reason to look elsewhere. We, we really That's need to thing. continue learning what's in our hands now and how to use this tool before we go elsewhere. And I don't say that people shouldn't invest elsewhere. I just, I, I, I lean heavily, as you call me a Bitcoin snob. It's not that I invest and trade in all these different coins and I investigate them all. But when it comes to talking to the general market and what I would tell my mother to buy or my little sister to buy, I'm gonna say, buy a little bit of Bitcoin, maybe start learning about this stuff. But if you call me asking about an alt and you've got a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, don't buy anything else. Just buy some more Bitcoin. Like, why would you buy anything else when the world respects Bitcoin, when merchants all over the world take Bitcoin, when stores all over the world are planning on putting uh, Bitcoin ATMs in their shops just because they're seeing more foot traffic as a result of them. Uh, advisors and investing advisors are telling people to buy Pepsi because people are going into Bitcoin ATMs to buy Bitcoin. Like, Bitcoin is the market, right? Everything else is tertiary to Bitcoin as a, uh, as a decentralized money and the secondary thing being Bitcoin as a decentralized technology, right? Tertiary is I, I, all these other things that people are popping up trying to be like Bitcoin, trying to take advantage of that opportunity as opposed to just investing in some Bitcoin, right? If they really believed it at all, think, why didn't they just own Bitcoin to begin with? I, I think you just made the case for why Bitcoin's gonna, gonna be obsolete. All right, excellent. Because, because, because you know, it is all about the money. That's what's driving this market. People are in it because they want to make money. They, you know, it, even if it's just they don't want their currency, their dollar to go down every year, uh, they, they like the idea of an appreciating currency, but most people are, are caught up in the hype of whoever saw, you know, investments go up two, five, to, you know, 10, 50 times in, you know, weeks or days uh, or minutes <laughs> sometimes. So, it is about the money and you know i think the mining community when you think about how much effort it is you're going to lose that mining community if the if the uh if processing the transactions isn't uh, profitable but we don't need uh, that so, mining community if so, everybody owns yeah, bitcoin and has a little miner so what that, all right but what that means is that um you know is is it is the miners are going to start to shift to the more profitable coins and that actually makes the case for a coin that does not have scarcity that if you take a coin that is limited to it's all it's got is 21 million coins for, that it will ever be able to have mined, then maybe that's not a good thing. And it starts to put into the light that other coins like Ethereum that, ha that are not, that have scarcity, they don't have scarcity, but it's controlled in a different way. And it's not, there isn't an ultimate cap that maybe those coins will be more valuable long term because the miners will continue to have an incentive. Well, I don't disagree with you in terms of a tool for monetary usage. Um, I don't think that would lead to Bitcoin obsolescence. I think that there will be 
multiple coins like Bitcoin that represent significant capital in the world and they'll hold the capital of the world. It's just like there's more than one bank, right? We have different banks. It's just instead of banking with Wells Fargo or Bank of America, you'll be banking on the Bitcoin blockchain or the Litecoin blockchain or, you know, or the Bank of America blockchain because they decide to, you know, get with it. Um, but to your point about a not a, 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 an inflationary currency, um, this is something that came across my desk today, actually. And I've been looking into the concept of universal basic income just because I see how technology is eliminating jobs and um, we've got to get creative about how we structure society. And so this is an example of essentially a currency that is run uh, by an elastic um, central authority that responds to the supply and demand of, in this case, it would start with dollars and it would feed more dollars into the system if the value of the unit is over a dollar and it would pull dollars and burn them out of the system if the value of the units are below dollars, uh, below one dollar. And it would do that by essentially uh, selling bonds and repaying them uh, to users of the currency. So great idea, great concept. Um, can we get a bunch of people to adopt this without showing them 10x returns? Uh, that's the challenge. But the beautiful thing about this is that this coin is not trying to sell you their coin. These guys are selling you a concept, an idea, the same way Bitcoin did in the very beginning, which was this is an idea contribute to this idea and you might gain from it in the long run um, and essentially registering with uh, you know with these guys they issue their currencies their currency periodically and then they manage the supply of it based on the market value so well I give you a, I give you a hard time about Bitcoin but I agree with you that you know the original concept of decentralizing money of making it independent of um, you know protecting uh, people's rights to you know um, control their own assets I, I, you know, I believe in that. I think that is ultimately what's going to propel and, and maintain the system. I think people can sense when a coin really isn't true to the original um, white paper, if you will. Right. Um, and uh, and that's why coins like Ripple, even though they're off the charts this week, you know, you got to think long term. People will figure it out. Right. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. And and you know, it's uh, it's. It's just scary to me to think of people kind of jumping in because they want to, you know, make money. And uh, certainly, you know, I'm all about making money too. But, uh, you know, what caught me and what got me investing in Bitcoin was its principle. And uh, I just want to make sure that people really look for those principles before putting their money somewhere else. I agree with you, which is why I only invest in coins that I believe in, ones that promote this mm -hmm. decentralized concept. And I think you can do really well. Um, you know, I haven't invested in Ripple at all. I don't believe it supports this concept of you know decentralized currency. I think it's very centralized around the banks and the institutions, um, and it's just you know like giving another uh, license to print money to you know uh, uh, the powers that be, so to speak. Um, so I, I'm a big supporter of the original concept. I think you can make money, and I think and I, I, I think you know that's still driving the market. So if we can switch gears again, um, yeah. I want to talk about investment strategy. You know, and, you know, let's talk about how do you make money? Assuming most people want to make more rather than less, we've got, if I think the three of us, we've got different approaches, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, am a big believer in the, you know, the buy and hold and, you know, creating the best diversified portfolio. And we can talk about what that means. Um, and, you know, you guys, you know, I think approach it differently. Um, so I, let, let's, let's, let's talk about that. How would you, how would you approach? Somebody comes into this market, they're new. How do, you know, how do they make money? What's the well, best frankly, strategy? you know, that's a really good point because, uh, you know, I don't know if there's really a one strategy. You could, you could take all kinds of investment uh, principles and apply it. Um, but in this how point, did you, how did you decide on, on what your what is your strategy and why do you like it? Why does it fit you? I mean, there can be lots of different yeah. strategies, but what, what works for you? So I've always looked for fundamentals in investment. Uh, you know, when I first invested in stocks, I bought blue chips, but I bought them when it seemed like a good time to buy. You know, I bought them in a low um, and it turned to 50 percent in, in a year. So um, 
looking for those fundamentals is really the way I try to invest. So when I do trade uh, and I'm looking at trading something or in investing in something, I look for the fundamentals to decide on something I'm going to trade in. And then if I'm going to do any trading, I might try to take some profit, but ultimately end up holding, um, you know, uh, uh, an amount that I'm comfortable with in my investment. Nice. So let's get to some specifics. What do you think are some of the blue chips of uh, cryptocurrencies? And what percentage of your portfolio are holding in the blue chips? And what percentage are you trading? Well, I'm going to avoid names. But uh, to comment on uh, Luke's uh, comment here about uh, considered considering only decentralized mineable coins. Um, I think that's kind of the key. One of the key things is that if I'm going to be looking at something, uh, for the most part, I'm looking at something that is mineable and decentralized, uh, not something that is another ICO token on top of a, another service. If they're just trying to raise money, then um, and they're not using any other avenue, then I'm I'm definitely skeptical of the ICO avenue at this point. And so, why are you why are you avoiding uh, names? Um, well, because well, just because I don't. Uh, the only one that I would say, the only ones that I would say, I'm I'm very confident in are, are Bitcoin and Litecoin. Um, I Ooh, think that I'm there's. Glad to have you say Litecoin. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's just because Bitcoin I think that. Well, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin and Litecoin. I think are snob thing, but but go ahead. <laughs> Well, I just think Bitcoin and Litecoin are synergistic in the way they operate. And, and, and like I said, it's not about one cryptocurrency to take them all, but it is about likely a set of, of decentralized deflationary currencies that give people the power to control capital in the world. And okay. that's, where, that's, that's where all the value, in my mind, that's where all the value in this market stands. Everything okay. else, everything else is tertiary, right? Um, I'd love to work with different software projects and come up with ways to use tokens to build up a project, but it's not about selling the tokens. It's about creating an actionable um, way to earn tokens and creating a full site, full value cycle so that those tokens attain a value. Um, and if, and if a project is not operating that way, then I tend to, um, I tend to avoid it. Fair enough. Steve. How do you approach uh, making money? Uh, well, it's a, it's a combination of things. Um, first thing is HODL. Hold on for dear life. Buy and HODL. Um, so I'd say 65% uh, of what I have invested is in um, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ether. Um, and then I try to also look for good coins, preferably pre-ICO, where I can really have confidence in the team, have confidence in the size of the problem they're planning to address, have confidence in their plan to address it, have confidence in their ability to make strategic partnerships that are going to be required to address it. So I have um, only four altcoins that are buy and hold because you know one of them is going to go to the moon kind of idea. Um, and then with the remaining stuff, I... I do two things. On GDAX, I just play price movements on Bitcoin alone. And that's where all my modeling comes in, right? So if I can share my screen, I don't know if you can flip over to it. Here's the curve that I believe represents adoption, right? And if I set this cap at a million bucks, at two million, at 100,000, at 25,000, this part of the curve still looks the same. And so when I see major price fluctuations above this, I sell some. When they approach the curve again, I buy some. But I also do that in conjunction with looking at the traditional price signals that technical traders do. And, and I can't be watching it all the time. So I have to you know, update limit orders occasionally. And, and, and what I just tune in for about an hour to a day and, and readjust what my buy and sell limit orders are. I'm also doing that on Poloniex with a number of the top market cap um, coins. I'm even in Ripple, even though I got out of Ripple a couple months ago because I said no utility here. I saw really strong signals that Ripple was going to take off, you know, December, I don't remember what it was, 27th or so. I got into some Ripple. It was great. Um, I just got back out of it, right? So um, I stay away from some things philosophically. Bitcoin Cash, uh, Ripple was one of them. <laughs> There are some things I like, you know, Zcash, Monero. Whether you like it or not, the uh, 
they're solid coins and they have the benefit that many of the others don't um, for some people in that it's a lot more anonymous. Um, and recent news articles were saying that, you know, whether it's the drug trafficking or the extortion or the, you know, the malware, uh, uh, ransomware, whatever, those folks are moving more into Zcash and Monero. I think, you know, just like pornography led adoption of the internet, uh, malware extortion is going to lead adoption of uh, <laughs> anonymous coins. So I think a lot of other things are going to be moving in that direction. I, I'm, I'm kind of holding a couple of those. Um, yeah, I, I, I've tended to invest actually in people's vices in the past. Um, there's no surprise. Um, okay, so you're, 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 you said you were 65% in, in the, uh, what you consider to be the hold on for dear life coins, the ones that you think are solid, whatever that means. Um, and 35% you, you know, you're trading. It's just trading on on fluctuations with technical indicators and and news, frankly. Great. Well, so I'm probably more on uh, the um, the farthest end in terms of hodling. Um, I would say 90% of my portfolio is, you know, I didn't trade at all in the last uh, any of it in the last three months. It took me two months to sort of pick the best coins I could, and I just held on to them. And then there's 10% that I trade. And I've got a, you know, reasons for both. Um, the reasons why I hold on to them is, you know, this is a market where if you look at your curve where everything's going up, well, I don't have to be really smart. I can pick almost anything. You can throw a dartboard at the top, you know, 50 coins. And as long as we're on that curve, they're going to go up. I could, everybody can be smart. I, but if I trade it, I might, you know, trade it at a time where it's low or, you know, lose money. I can take a loss if I trade. But if I hold on to it, I, I'm, I'm guaranteed to it's just going to keep going up, at least as long as we're on that, that early stage of, of that curve. So uh, one part, and that's just been my experience, too. I, you know, I made some trades, and then I, afterwards I go, gosh, I would have been better just to keep the original coins that I had and just hold on to them. I kind of learned from experience that way, and, and I learned that early on. And so for the last, uh, you know, ever since August, I've been trying to build the strongest portfolio that I can, and strong in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I believe that there are going to be a lot of coins that survive, and they and they play different functions. And I try to find the ones that I think are going to be the leaders, and the ones that, um, you know, I I feel are are solid, and that are going to grow just by the network effect, just by the number of new people coming in. So that technology adoption curve is going to come into play, because everybody's going to want them. And you know, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, those are obvious because in the U.S., most people are going to come in through. Uh, through Coinbase or one of the you know cash to crypto exchanges where they only have one or two or three options and that's Bitcoin, Litecoin, and uh, and Ethereum and now just recently uh, Coinbase added Bitcoin Cash but for philosophical reasons similar to you Steve I wouldn't buy Bitcoin Cash um, so um, so you know those are you know I view as solid. Um, and then there are a number of others that are, I think are approaching that, that are rival platforms, um, you know, that I think, you know, approach solid or are likely to be solid, at least in the near term. And those might be Neo, might be Monero, might be um, uh, IOTA, uh, might be EOS. Those are other sort of major platforms that you say, look, um, you know, the, some of them like, you know, EOS do, don't even have, you know, working products yet, but they they just have prototypes that are out. Um, but I, you know, I believe they're going to be solid. So, um, so that's where 90% is, is just in there. And I just don't have the time to be doing a lot of trading. And when I do trade, I'm likely to lose money. So that's, that's, you know, that's sort of my philosophy, but I do think it's important that everybody trade. And I think it's important that I improve my trading skills. And I don't think I'm terrible at it. I, I just think that the odds are, you know, a lot of trading involves emotion. And it, as much as you try to take it out, it comes into play and you end up <laughs> making funny moves when you're trading. But I do think trading is important. So I do, you know, 10% I do trading um, and 10% is still a significant. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that's just because if you stay in the crypto game long enough, you're, this stuff just seems to, you know, increase. Um, but the, what, what I learned from trading is how to scale in and how to scale out, how to get in and how to get out. And I think anybody who eventually think that they're going to need to rotate or shift their portfolio because these coins are not going to stay the same. The values, their role in the marketplace, who the leaders are, what's the best technology, you know, how many people are adopting them, 
th that's going to continue to change. So you need to, you know, be smart about when a coin is losing value, or you know, what's an up-and-coming new coin where you can improve your your return. Um, and so some trading is is helpful because you need to understand charting skills. You need to understand um, uh, the charting patterns that will tell you when's a good time to get in and get out. Um, and I, so I, I really try to practice that because um, I think it's a valuable skill um, just based on, the, I think this is going to continue to be volatile. I think the returns are going to inc be incredible. And I think you can increase those returns the more you understand uh, how the technicals work. Uh, so that's how I approach it. And, uh, and one other short story around this. So uh, my son, I got into this this summer. And he's very much into the tra trading mentality. He's faster than I am. He, he looks at the charts and the patterns, and he can see them, and he can trade. He trades with his phone, you know, and, and he can, you know, partly because he's younger, but, you know, he just so is very quick to identify and to trade, and he just, you know, is never satisfied unless the coin is going up. And I kind of take the opposite view. Is it doesn't have to go up today or tomorrow. As long as I, you know, have researched the project, I understand what they're trying to do, and I know that eventually, uh, someone's going to shine the light on it. And as soon as they shine the light on it, then everybody piles into it. And I've gotten into some of these ICOs when you know they're selling for a penny or two cents. And maybe their ICO price was 10 cents, and they've gone down to two cents. And I've even bought them in at 10 cents in the ICO. And then they come out, and nobody knows anything about the project. And they're on Ether Delta, which is a, a low-volume decentralized exchange. And they're not anywhere else. And nobody's, there's just no market for them. And the price plummets as everybody tries to get out. And I get in at 10 cents, and now my value, the value when it goes down to 2 cents, is now 20% uh, of what I paid for. But I buy a whole bunch more because they're so cheap. I thought it was a good deal when I was in the ICO. Okay, I'll just load up. I'll buy two, three, four, five times my original price. And so when it finally moves, it goes from 2 cents back up to 10 cents. If it just goes up to the ICO price, man, I'm, I've already made money. And then if it gets from the ICO price and you start getting a 10x or a 20x, you can, you can really do well. Um, and so I take that strategy where it's, but a lot, oftentimes I've had to hold them for two, three, four, five months, but I know, I know that nobody has, you know, reckon, nobody has heard of this coin yet. But I've researched the project and I go, that's got a solid team. It's got a, it's got a really, they're going to be a leader in the marketplace. Nobody else is doing it. As soon as people start talking about it, this is going to go up. And so I, when I compare my portfolio with my, my son, there are times he'll tell me, hey, how'd you do this week? And he always calls me right after he said this tremendous week where, you know, he's done a bunch of trades. Oh, I've done three X this week on my portfolio. Like, wow, that's incredible. And, uh, you know, but then he'll have these periods where, you know, he's either out of the market or he can't find a good trade or the trades are going against them. And I'm just holding on. If I look over the long term, he might have a three X over a short period, but I might have a five X over the long period. So. You know, those are those are my stories in terms of you know trading strategy. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey guys, we're uh, we're well past the eight o'clock hour. I'd say uh, we probably let everybody uh, head off for the night. Wrap this up. Any uh, final points you you guys want to add here? Um, well, I, I was uh, something you guys were talking about earlier was the distribution of the the top coins in terms of market cap. I had quickly created a chart of, you know, November 26th distribution versus January 2nd today, uh -huh. um, showing how, you know, how much they've, this is the top 50 coins on my screen right now. Um, I don't know how to get my screen on there. It's, it's, uh, hang on, let me so. walk it. There you go. You're up. I see it. But, um, you know, what Ryan was saying is that this, you know, this has continued to rise, right? The Bitcoin number one, right? Here's November 26th, and it's this much more, you know, a month and four days later, six days later. And what Roger was saying is a lot of these guys are coming up uh, behind it, too, you know, down in this area. Yeah. And this is, by the way, a power law distribution, and you can fit this. I have a model that fitted on November. I haven't done one for January yet, but um, anyway, that's kind of interesting that it's flattening out. Uh, because you'd expect what's it to, also yeah go ahead I was gonna say what's also neat is if you looked at that like say six months ago or a year ago that's a whole different list 
uh, if you right. take so Bitcoin off the here, list, you see a simple distribution. Out, the position of some of these have changed on the list. These are wrong. These are all uh, the labels for November 26th. For instance, now, you know, um, I think you'll find that some of these have rearranged a bit and taken different positions. And there's a lot of things that used to be in that top 50 or so that are way, way down in the hundreds. But they're, you know, like what was that? I was looking at one with somebody today, uh, Namecoin. Right. They were telling me about some ICO that was launching to decentralized DNS services. And I went, oh, they did that right after Bitcoin. It's called Namecoin. Yep. <laughs> and uh, it's been around for quite a while. And you can find it down there in like somewhere around number 200. Um, still going up in value. Right. Yeah. Way. So Namecoin had a great had a great few days here recently. And I, I was able to turn that around and create more Bitcoin by nice. buying and selling Namecoin. Right. Awesome. Yeah. And Civic is another one of those. Right. It's pretty low in the in the market cap right, right now. Yep. But it's got a good model. It's got a lot of utility for what they're trying to do. They're trying to do identity uh, yeah. and identity verification. Um, and that's another one that's been sort you know fairly predictable in terms of price movement and continue to appreciate over the long term. Yeah. Um, yeah, Namecoin's been around since 2013, it looks like, on uh, CoinMarketCap's history. Yeah, it looks like Civic had a little flash crash a couple of hours ago, just after I finished saying great things about it. <laughs> <laughs> All but right, it's good, good because uh, you know, it was an entry point, and I had, a, I had a buy limit order, and I got in. Nice. Uh, so so, so that right. was a trade for you, but how do you, uh, how do you decide? Where do you find the coins that you want to trade? Um, I look for the ones that, well, the, some of the same criteria that you had, right? Things that have sort of have a solid business model, some argument for them, like, you know, IOTA, it, it, you know, it's got Microsoft backing, for instance, and it's, the goal is ultimately to do a person-to-person a, a -person transaction thing that can run on a smartphone as the main node, right? Um, so there's that, and then there's just market cap and the predictability of the movements. If it's something that there's clearly, like, really odd, erratic movement that doesn't seem related to news or related to any other coin or it's part of some kind of you know pump and dump or market manipulation I try to stay away from those so the ones that have some predictability to the movements are the ones that I you know I'll look at a history of a bunch of coins the ones that have fairly high market cap so I know that there's not a lot of noise in the signal of the information right so there's a there's a, a definite central tendency you know what I'm saying it's statistically significant number of trades is happening Oh, lost you. Well, I agree with what he was saying. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, well, you know, actually, while, while we're on that, real quick, um, I think I might have shown this before, but um, using CoinMarketCap, uh, let's share my screen real quick. And there we go. Using CoinMarketCap, um, this is probably where he was referring to. So I like to do the total coin list, which is all the way at the top here. If you click the currencies number here, then you'll get the total list. And then I like to separate by seven day chart or the 24 hour chart sometimes and look for movement. And so you'll see things that are totally hyped because you'll see thousands of percent here in seven days. If this refreshes for me, come on. There we go. 6,000% on network token with a million dollar market cap and $55,000 traded. That is not very liquid. But you can go through here and look through uh, volume compared to market cap. Look for the star. If it's a star, then it's a pre mined coin and it's not mineable. Um, and that can give you some indicators, but you see some huge numbers here, but then you see nothing actually happening. Those aren't really, that's not really money being made, right? But if you scroll down a little further and you get to somewhere like Zoin, $52 million market cap, 1.6 million for the day, not a huge market, but enough to play with a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars even. Um, so I, so I agree, little, you know, Coin market cap is a great way to identify coins that might meet your investment criteria. Right. And you can see which ones, you know, have been making some moves recently. There are two other sites that are really interesting. I don't know that you guys have used them. Yeah. Um, one is called solume.io. I have. S-O-L-U-M-E.io. And that's, that's looking at social volume. Yep. This one's really handy. Oops. 
And so if you think about the ones that social volume, you know, it's like the ones that people are talking about in the social media and that are coming up the most, that gives you an indication of the ones that people are excited about. And, you know, presumably that there's often a correlation between the ones that people are talking about and the coins that start to move. So I think that site right. is really cool. And then Google um, Trends is a great way to just look for what's being searched too. And so you can see, let's see interest over time in Bitcoin and then compare Ethereum. Yeah, that's, that's a good one too. A lot of, a lot of times I look for the subreddit group for a coin, you know, that I'm just getting familiar with. So if, if right. Google Trends is showing that going up, then, you know, that means a lot of people are starting to inquire about it. Right. Um, uh, let's see. One, one other site, coinloop.io. Have you used that one? Coinloop? No, I haven't heard of that. Let's try that. So this one actually is uh, artificial intelligence signals. So oh, it, okay. It try to predict, you know, uh, it try to predict which which is the next uh, coin that's going up. Oh, interesting. I just came across something today. I can't remember what it's called, but I'll try to find it for next time. Yeah, if you scroll down further, I think you'll see oh, some of the signals. There's some. Yep, V chain, salt. Yeah. Down, so if you know, you're just looking for the signal. next, you know, big thing, you know, looking at the oh, ones that are, you know, moving there with high percentages. Yeah. It also give you some ideas of what's the next next thing that's going to move. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, uh, well, let's wrap this up. Uh, we'll catch up with Stephen. Hopefully, he's uh, still good over there. And uh, yeah, I'm still thank here. You all. Oh, there you are. Okay. You got cut off from <laughs> us for a little while. Yeah, I noticed it went dead. Okay. Anyways, uh, hey, thank you guys both for for being on here. Thanks to our audience for joining us. Um, this has been definitely fun, and I hope we can uh, keep up the routine on Tuesdays. And uh, don't forget, live here in person Wednesday afternoons as well down at the White River Coworks. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys there as well. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Steve. Right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye.